Today we're making all the parts for the cinematic video player. Everything from circuit board assembly, CNC milling the wood and brass parts, laser cut acrylic and more. Stick around. Welcome back and I hope you had a nice holiday. As the year comes to a close, today we're circling back on the cinematic project. If you recall in the last update, we had designed everything from the body, the circuit board, and even the software logic. I did everything I could before getting the actual parts. The boards were sent off to be made and other building materials were ordered, including the wood for the cabinet, acrylic for the face, and brass for all the hardware. Today we're going to test out and finalize the board design, then mill the enclosure and assembly parts in preparation for final assembly. It's a lot to cover, so let's get started. So I received the boards a few days ago and they look great. I also got a solder stencil. Also there weren't many surface mount parts but the stencils are cheap and they make assembly fast. To use the stencil I have a simple screen print board that I mount the stencil to. I always 3D print a board alignment tool which differs from project to project but it's an easy way to align and print the boards with solder paste without having to register the screen with every board. With that done I load a board, pull the paste and head over to the electronics workbench to place the parts. For this prototype, I hand place the parts, then using a standard four phase reflow cycle, I bake them in my modified T962 reflow oven. This thing's pretty cheap on Amazon and it works fine for these short runs. Once they cool to room temp, I hand place all the remaining through hole parts and complete the board. Through this process, I'm already taking notes on board layout changes. One big gotcha this time around was that the screen connector orientation was inverted accidentally. Hey, things happen. While it's not critical to the functionality, it causes an offset in the LCD that's not easy to resolve. With the board assembled, I did some functional testing and identified a few other issues that needed to be resolved. One, the brushless fan didn't have enough operating voltage range to take advantage of my regulator circuit. But since regulating the fan speed isn't relevant to the core functionality, we'll do some value engineering to remove the components and save some money. Two, the power connector being used is partially obstructed by the button LED headers, so I plan to power the board directly from the header rather than using a micro USB port. Three, the power button header partially obstructs the SD card. I was able to work around this on this build, but it needs to move. Four, of course fixing the orientation on the LCD connector and double checking that the rest of the board is good. These were some silly mistakes that should have been caught, but hey, things happen. Now let's dive into Altium Designer and make these changes. But first, let's talk about that. This video is sponsored by Altium. If you're interested in learning a great electronics design software, take a moment to download a free copy and see what you're missing. I've put links in the description and with Altium Designer, these projects are a piece of cake. The efficient workspace has some of the best features in the industry. Through all phases of your development, you'll be empowered to do your best work as you grow into its more advanced capabilities. The link below will allow you a free trial version of the software so that you can check it out and see what Enterprise Class ECAD feels like. Now back to the project. In Altium, I open up the schematic and replace the offending components, then add in the new components for the changes I mentioned above. With the new ports set up in the schematic, I annotate the new components, then push changes to the PCB. In PCB view, I unroute the entire board and that gives me the freedom to move components around and add new headers and account for all the clearance issues I had, improving the layout. Under most circumstances, I just unroute specific components, which is easy to do with using the tab hotkey. But in this case, the circuit's very simple and AutoRouter did such a good job, uh, the extra placement freedom's worth it. After the changes were made, I hit AutoRouter and 99% of my work was done. The power trace widths were manually increased and a DRC was ran to ensure this build didn't introduce any issues. These changes will resolve the placement issues and add a power connector and distribute accessory headers better across the board. With that, the manufacturing files were created, exported, and uploaded to JLCPCB. That said, are there any affordable short-run domestic board manufacturers? I've looked around from time to time and they always have a high cost of entry and they're just not economically feasible. Sending all my jobs to China isn't feasible either, so I'd love to know if you share them in the comments below. With the board changes made, next up is the enclosure. So back in Fusion 360, let's look at the components. We got the main body or TV cabinet is solid hardwood. And for that, I'm going to mill it from a block of purple heart wood. To do that, I made a flip jig fixture to hold the stock and subsequent work piece in place. In Fusion 360, I create a model of the fixture, then clone the cabinet and represent the two orientations used in the milling process. As purple heart is quite dense and hard wood, coming in at 1860 on the Jenka scale of hardness, choosing the right bit to give us clean finish without burring or causing fur on the shallow step downs is important. For this, all operations will be performed using a diamond-coated quarter-inch two-flute downcut flat-end mill. 
by Harvey Tools. This end mill will give the excellent surface finish in these internal cavities as well as the top edges. The only con of this end mill is that the down cut it won't evacuate the chips very well, so I'll need to manually keep an eye on the cut area as they build up. I've put a link in the description to find out more about this tool. Step one will be the hollowing operation to clear out the cabinet cavity. For that, I use an adaptive rough to remove a majority of the material, then follow up contour passes to clean up the outside, inside, and inner pockets. All operations were ran around 40 inches per minute with a step down of 0.15 inch. The piece was held in place using double-sided neato tape, so I wanted to keep the lateral forces down. Probably could have ran a little bit faster, but it would have been risky. When the first setup was complete, I flipped the part, and because the top edge was so thin, I added a 3D printed insert to add thickness and rigidity to the part that seats into the mating fixture pocket on the second operation. Make sense? Again, I'll be using Neato tape to hold it in place. For the second step, I perform an adaptive operation with shallow area to finish off the top fillet and bezel details. This operation was ran a little bit slower to safely remove material around the thin cross member on the face. The part came out absolutely beautiful. The diamond coated bit left an incredible finish that required minimal sanding to finish it. To bring out the color of the purple heart, I wiped acetone on the faces to draw the resins of the color to the surface. Next, I coat the cabinet with a thin coat of matte clear UV acrylic, and when dry, I scuffed with Scotch-Brite, then applied a finished coat of gloss clear UV acrylic to seal the finish and color in the cabinet. Next up was to mill the bezel. This part could have been milled from anything white, but to keep this classy, I decided to use holly. It's dense and pure finish is exquisite on detailed parts. It almost looks like ivory. Though this may otherwise go unnoticed, I wanted to make this project look as nice and as real as a retro TV, and these small details make the difference, at least to me. The holly is a mere one millimeters thick, and I used a couple of simple contour cuts to mill this part out. Clean and perfect, this part will finish the bezel with a natural white color that complements the brass and purple heart of the cabinet. Back in Fusion 360, the internal assembly consists of several parts which organize and bring together all of the technology. The device sub-assembly parts include the front panel, which holds the front bezel buttons, LEDs, and LCD display, the fan sent assembly, which holds the fan, wheel, servo, and ducts, and the rear panel, which encases the sent ducts, USB power connector, and fan venturi. These will all be printed on the Form 3 using their black resin. It has a great matte black finish, and its dimensional accuracy is well suited for these interlocking parts. The models are exported as STL files, then loaded up in the Formlabs Preform slicing software. I always manually orient my parts in Preform to reduce the number of supports on external faces or faces that require the best finish. I also reduce the support density to around 0.6 and the touch point size down to around 0.3. This will give it a great finish and make the supports easy to remove once printed. These parts took almost 12 hours to print on the Form 3 at a 0.1 millimeter layer resolution. When the parts were completed, they're cleaned in 99% IPA and then when dry, they're lightly sanded with a sanding block and Scotch-Brite pads to remove any layer lines and support imperfections. To finish the assembly parts, I spray them with a matte clear UV acrylic spray and they're good to go. Now to mill the brass antenna assembly, I'll use the pocket NC and a 25 millimeter rod of brass. After setting up the part in Fusion 360 with the pocket NC's fixture, the multi-axis tool paths are created. The base is roughed using a 1 8 inch 3 flute flat end mill and a 3D adaptive operation. The final dome, I run a contour and spiral operation using a 1 8 inch 2 flute ball end mill. Finally, I added a couple drill holes for the 1.5 millimeter antennas to be placed. These were post-processed and sent over to the mill to run. By the way, if you're curious about how to set up operations for the pocket NC or other 5-axis CNC's, 
I have a video on that, that which I'll link in the description below. It gives you a getting started overview of the important steps to generate five axis toolpaths. And the Pocket NC is great for these multi-axis parts and makes child's play of this task. Rounding the head and drilling a couple pilot holes for the antennas. To finish it off, I sand it using five levels of abrasive foam sanding pads, then buff it with mother's mag and aluminum polish for a mirror-like shine. Next, to create the cabinet legs, I used 8mm rods of brass. I used my cordless drill to chuck the pieces and run them against my belt sander to put a taper on the legs. Once roughed, I also finish sanded them using the five levels of abrasive foam sanding pads and buffed them with polish. These were trimmed to length and mounted on the body. The final brass parts remaining are the buttons for the front of the bezel. These will be cut from brass rod then polished. Ideally, I would use a metal lathe for these components. They would probably work great. I don't have one at the moment. Maybe that's my next tool. A couple parts to finish off the bezel are the acrylic face and button face vinyl. These were both laser cut for its precision and then etched with the cinematic name on the front acrylic. The profiles were exported from Fusion 360 sketches, then imported into Lightburn software to set up and push them to the laser. The vinyl is placed on the acrylic to finish off the button panel and scent ducts. With that, all the parts are ready to go. A lot of work has gone into this little project, but it'll be cool. While I was making this video, I received an update that the boards were delayed in customs, and I won't be receiving them until after the new year, which is a bummer, but no big deal. In the upcoming video, I'll be assembling the new boards, going through the final assembly, encoding the servo data into movies, loading the scent wheel, and then demoing the finished product. So be sure to stay tuned for that. This year has been a bit of a whirlwind with COVID and work and Hopefully you've enjoyed the new direction of the channel. Working in the shop has helped me stay grounded for sure. If you have ideas you'd like to see in the channel in the new year, please be sure to leave them in the comments below or shoot me an email at admin at DIY.engineering. If you're new here, hit the subscribe button and ring that notification bell. It'll help keep you notified when new videos are released. And if you like this particular video, give it a big thumbs up. It helps a lot and it's kind of how this platform works. Hopefully you enjoyed following this project. It's been fun to make. I wish you all a happy and productive new year. And until then, be safe, have fun, and I'll see you next time. Hey, if you liked the video, please subscribe to the channel. It's how we're building the community. Also allow me to bring better content. Also check me out on these other social networks. There's lots of cool stuff there too. See ya.